Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about the audio class D amplifier by testing an output filter. First by measuring its AC response over a specific frequency range and then seeing how it works on an actual amplifier output. Does it do what it's supposed to? Well, if you're curious, then keep watching. A big part of any class D audio amplifier is the output filter. You need to calculate it, simulation is a big plus, but the true test lies in the practical construction. Does it work as intended? So let's start by looking at how a filter can be measured. In the circuit simulator, we made AC simulations that gave us the response of the filter to an input stimulus, telling us the amplitude ratio of the output to input signal, but also the phase shift, and in real life, we can perform the same measurement by creating a Bode plot. So for this, we will be using a signal generator and an oscilloscope with at least two channels. Now, this can be done manually, point by point, but nowadays, there are quite a few dedicated tools that can perform this analysis automatically, and some of the more modern oscilloscopes also have this function built into them. So the measurement works as follows. You need a programmable signal source so something into which you can program the AC signal amplitude, any sort of DC offset that you might need, the frequency span over which you want to make the measurement, and then the number of steps, so through which you want to go through the frequency span, and then the actual measurement relies on measuring the signal that comes out of your test circuit, and for added precision, you will also want to measure the signal going into the test circuit. So even though you've programmed a specific signal to be injected, because of various non-ideal behaviors like output impedance of your signal source or delays occurring over the cables, the exact signal that reaches your test circuit might be slightly different from what you've started off with. So that's why it's very important to measure also the injected signal. Finally, your measurement equipment will analyze the two inputs, extract the specific signal that was injected, and then calculate their amplitude ratio and phase ratio and plot them out on a dual graph. And it's important to mention that your test equipment should be able to extract the signal of interest, and this is specifically important in noisy circuits like power supplies, for example, where other than your signal of interest, you have all sorts of other noises going on. So to try things out, I prepared this setup right here. So what I have is an analog discovery tool. I'm using this tool because it has a built-in Bode analyzer, so it has its own signal generator and then oscilloscope inputs. So I'm using the signal generator output to feed a basic filter, so built with a 22 microhenry inductor and a 690 nanohenry capacitor, driving a 4 ohm load. And then I'm using the oscilloscope probes to measure both the input and the output of the filter. So you can work out what the ratio of amplitudes and the phase difference is between the input and output signal. So for that I set the waveforms program into network mode, I'm spanning between 1 kHz and 2 MHz, and I'm measuring over 1000 points. So if we run the measurement, so we can see our typical response. We have a flat response up until a point where the output starts to drop off, and then it goes down until it reaches a point at which the various parasitics start to kick in. Now, based on the calculations, this filter should have a corner frequency around 40.8 kHz, but if we look at our response, it's a bit difficult to figure out where exactly the corner frequency is. Now, the exact shape of the filter response is Q factor dependent. So to illustrate that, I prepared this basic simulation with an AC source, a filter, and then a resistor that has three different values. So two, four, and eight ohms. So if we run the simulation and look at the output, we see three different shapes corresponding to the three different types of response. So with a resistor value of two, we have an overdamped situation, with 4 ohms we have a critically damped situation, and then finally with 8 ohms we have an underdamped response. So the red curve is the underdamped one. So simply looking at the amplitude profile is not enough to figure out where exactly the corner frequency is for such a filter. But what does stay constant regardless of the Q factor is the phase difference. So regardless of the Q factor, all three load values will result in the same point at which they pass through 90 degrees. 
So at this point, it's important to also point out that if you're designing a filter, it will work for a specific load. If you play around with the load value, you put a different speaker impedance, the filter is not going to work that well. It will not get the ideal critically damped response. So now, if we do come back to the measurement, and rather than looking on the amplitude graph, we look on the bottom side on the phase graph, we can identify that the minus 90 degree point is at 46.6 kilohertz. So it's not exactly the 40.8 that the calculations were telling us, but at the same time, it's important to remember that the components used, the real life components, usually have 10 to 20% tolerance, especially the reactive ones. So this is perfectly normal. Now, for a differential filter, like the ones used in a bridge tide load class D audio amplifier output, to be able to measure the differential response of the filter, you can perform the same measurement like before, so to generate a body plot, but with a few details kept in mind. So you still sweep a frequency of the injected signal and you measure the input and output to calculate their ratio, but since the filter is differential, the injected signal, as well as the input and output measurements, also need to be differential. So one way of doing this is as follows. You take your single-ended signal generator output, and rather than injecting it directly into your signal, you pass it through an isolation transformer. So one side of the transformer is connected to ground, and the output has its lines freely floating. So a transformer used this way is also called a balon. Now, just to prevent the outputs from developing uncontrolled offsets, in reference to ground, you can add a couple large value resistors and either directly connect this point to ground if you want the differential output to oscillate around the zero volt point, or add an extra DC offsetting power supply. So this way you can precisely control what offset you want in your differential signal source. Finally, to actually perform the measurement, you need a couple differential oscilloscope probes, so some sort of circuit that can perform the differentiation between the two lines, so to subtract one from the other, and you will need two of these, so one to measure the output and one to measure the input. So this time it's really important to also measure the input because whatever you've programmed and whatever enters your circuit can be two completely different things, so amplitude differences are highly likely to occur as well as phase differences. So doesn't seem that complicated. Let's try this thing out now. Now, for this experiment, I will continue using the Analog Discovery 2 because this device comes with built-in differential inputs. So I can connect four oscilloscope probes to this and then its input stage will perform the subtraction of one channel from the other. So I don't need a special differential probe for the measurement. Now, for the setup, I'm using an isolation transformer to create the differential output. So this is a ferrite core one-to-one -one transformer that I had lying around. And it's important to mention that the isolation transformer that you're using needs to be built around the core that can support the higher frequency range that you want to work with. So the core still needs to provide permeability at your higher frequency range. Finally, as test filter, I've built the filter that we worked on last time. So this is the hybrid filter built with snubbers and on the output I have an 8 ohm load. So now if we run the measurement to see exactly what we get, I have the same 1 kHz to 2 MHz span, and if we have a bit of patience, we can see that we are getting a very similar result to last time. So our corner frequency, the point where phase goes through 90 degrees, is at 43 kHz. Now it's perfectly normal to get this result, because last time we measured the differential mode equivalent of this particular filter. And now we can also test the common mode response of this filter, so for that I changed things around a bit, I connected the inputs together and also connected the outputs together and then I reverted back to the setup that we had with the very first measurement. So I'm injecting a single-ended signal onto the input, measuring it with one probe and then also measuring the output with the other probe. So the load was completely removed because there's no current passing through it anyway. So if we come back to the measurement window, run another measurement between a kilohertz and two megahertz, we can see that we are getting a result similar to what the simulation was telling us. So our corner frequency is at a higher frequency than before, so it's somewhere around 100 kHz right now, and the gain also has a bit of peaking. So thanks to the snubber, this is not a very large gain peak, but it's there nevertheless. So 
the filter works as predicted by the simulator, to a certain extent at least. Some variations will still occur, since most reactive components have a 10-20% to value tolerance, and also various parasitics are usually ignored when performing the simulations. So the final measurement to perform today is to look at how our hybrid filter handles the output of an actual class D switching amplifier. For this, I have a small breakout board from the internet, so I'm not sure what is the actual IC name present on the board since the name has been erased, but I will be adding our filter in between this board and the resistive load to see how it works. So what I did here, I set up my board to amplify a 20 kHz sine wave, and we can analyze the output waveforms just to get a better understanding of what we're trying to filter. So in yellow and in pink we have the direct output lines and then in white at the moment I have the mathematical operator which is subtracting one of the outputs from the other so we can get our differential mode output. So if we zoom in a bit we can see that the two outputs are not switching at the same time so we do not have a demodulation here. We can observe this even better if we zoom out a bit so we can see on our differential output the clear free level output, so either we have a high voltage, a low voltage or a zero, we have a very clear ternary modulation implemented here. If we zoom back in we can observe another thing, which is the frequency. So our output channels are running at about 760 kilohertz, whereas the deferential output is at 1.5 megahertz, so it's double that. And another thing that we can do is rather than looking at the difference between the two outputs, look at the sum of them. So to figure out what our common mode content is. So if we do this, we can see that there is a very clear common mode content appearing. So if we sum up the two outputs, there's always some common mode switching going on, multiple levels. So there's quite a bit to filter both on the common mode side and on the differential mode side. So now it's time to add the filter and see what happens with all of this noise. First, we can look at the differential mode response of the amplifier. So for that I connected the amplifier to my analog discovery again. So this is providing the supply voltage and the input signal. And of course I'm taking advantage again of the differential inputs to measure the input side of the filter and also the output side. So if we now turn to the measurement, so what we can see here in yellow is the input side of the filter. So this is where all the switching is going on. So if I zoom out a bit because of the number of points, we can't see that clearly, but that's what it is. And then on the bottom in blue, we have the differential output. So what is happening after the filter? Now, as it stands like this, the filter seems to be doing quite a good job. But we can get a much better idea if we look at the two signals from a spectrum point of view. So now I turned on the spectrum viewer of the analog discovery. And again, in yellow, we have the response before the filter and in blue the response after the filter. So at around 1 kHz we see the audio signal, and then at upper frequencies we see the switching frequency and the various harmonics that were generated. So what we can see is that the blue trace, the one after the filter, is much much cleaner than the yellow trace, the one before the filter. So specifically here at the switching frequency, which is at about 700 something kHz, we can see that there is an almost 30 decibel reduction in noise amplitude. And of course with all of the other spikes we can see very clear reductions. So the filter seems to be doing its job quite well. And the last thing to look at is the common mode response of our filter. So for that I reverted back to the simple single ended probes and to measure the circuit on the one side on the input added a couple resistors in between the two differential outputs and I'm measuring in between them. So this provides the average input value and then on the output my load is anyway made from multiple resistors so I'm measuring on the middle of the load. So again to observe the average output value. So now if we look at the waveforms that we're getting, so what I have here is the time domain response. So in yellow is the response at the filter input. So here we can see the nice square wave running at about 780 kilohertz and then in blue we can see the signal after the filter which is much smaller and running at the same frequency. So another thing that we can observe of course is that the blue signal is a sine wave. So most of the high frequency content of the initial square wave have been well filtered out. 
but of course we can get a far better result if we look at the spectral content. So again, in yellow we can see the response before the filter, and then in blue we can see the response after the filter. So we have a clear spike at our switching frequency, which is reduced by about 20 decibels, and then all of the various other harmonics are far better reduced. Now, of course, the effectiveness of the filter is influenced by the way you lay it out. So if you have wires all over the place like I have, this is not going to give you the best results. But the techniques that I show you today should be good enough to test out your filters and the response of your amplifier. In the end, filter design is not as complicated as it might first seem, if you take care of the basics. So use a couple formulas to get some initial component values, observe the response of your circuit in the simulator, and then finally build it and test it out. Of course, you can skip the initial bit with the calculations by checking out the amplifier's datasheet. So usually you will have some recommended component values for each typical speaker load. However, understanding how the filter works is critical if you need to make any sort of adjustments or improvements to the initial recommended values. And with that said, hope you got some useful information after this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos, and see you next time. Bye bye!